Because that's not getting me any closer to the end. And so he has to kind of paraphrase it. He has to dig deeper. There's got to be some sort of loophole I can find or look at that will further narrow down what Jesus expects of me to do. So he says, well then, who is my neighbor? You see, there has to be something with the law. Because I can't do that. I can't perfectly love God with all my heart, soul, and strength from birth, from conception to the grave, and I sure as heck haven't loved my neighbor as myself. So maybe if I narrow down the scope of the command, it'll become more manageable for me. So who is exactly my neighbor, and what is he really asking? Tell me who isn't my neighbor. Tell me who I don't have to love. So I can just avoid them altogether and get on with my merry way. And so Jesus tells the parable. The very well-known parable, a man traveling down from Jerusalem falls into the hands of robbers, beaten, stripped of his clothes, left alongside the road half dead. And Jesus brings up two of the greatest men that this expert in the law would have known. The priest and his sidekick, the Levite. And as Jesus is telling the story, you have to assume the man's just thinking, well, the priest knows the law, the Levite knows the law, I knew the law. So of course they're going to know they need to stop and help this man. But they don't. And so who's the next one that's going to come along? Who's the the next ball that's going to be dropped? Because I can't imagine that both of them would have walked past. Is there someone greater out there than a priest or a Levite? Jesus says, yeah, it's your greatest enemy. To say that Samaritans and Jews hated one another would be putting it kindly. To say that Jesus elevating a Samaritan over a priest and a Levite would be offensive and rude to Jewish ears would be putting it rather lightly. But this is exactly who Jesus places before the eyes of this expert in the law. But here's the twist. You see, if the point of this parable was just go and do likewise, if the point of this parable was to convince this expert in the law that he needed to love everyone, that he needed to be a neighbor to everyone, including the Samaritan, the man in the ditch, grasping his final breath, would have been the Samaritan. You see, the point of it, Jesus would have told that this is the man, this is you now walking down the street, and your worst enemy is lying in a gutter. He needs your love. He needs your help. But that's not who it is. Jesus makes the man who gives help the Samaritan. And it's confusing. And maybe you've never asked yourself or thought about it in that way before, but Jesus is telling something to this man. He's not simply just saying, go and do likewise, emulate this Samaritan. But look at the final question that Jesus asks him. It's not, who is my neighbor, which was the question the expert in the law asked him, but rather it was, which of these three was a neighbor to the man? You see, the point of the parable that Jesus is trying to get this man to realize is that who in your life has come to meet you where you are? Who in your life has put his own life on the line to clothe you, to pick you up, 
to bandage your wounds, to wash them clean, to put you on his donkey, to take you to an inn, to take care of you, to feed you, to pay at all costs, whatever it will be, to bring you back to health. We're not told, but it doesn't seem to appear that this expert in the law ever got it. But I pray that you do. For you see, you have someone in your life that has done all of those things for you. You have a good Samaritan who has bandaged your wounds, who has washed your wounds of your sin for a lack of love. He washed them clean in the waters of baptism. You have a good Samaritan who clothed you with himself, who placed you, you, your sin on himself and carried you to safety. You have a good Samaritan who gave up his life to give you life. You have a good Samaritan who feeds you with his very body and blood for strength and forgiveness when you're weak. You see, the very good Samaritan that Jesus wanted to point this expert in the law to was standing right in front of him, was telling him the very story, was telling this man, you cannot keep the law up to the expectations that the law requires. But you have one who has rescued you, who has snatched you from the pangs of death and brought you back to life. You see, then the go and do likewise takes on a whole new meaning. It's not that Jesus wants you to follow after this fictitious Samaritan. But he wants you to follow him. Knowing that you have tasted, you have experienced, you have received the very love of your good Samaritan, Jesus, you can now share that love with everyone around you. Not expecting it in return, not holding out for those you think that might harm you or abuse your love. Not waiting to see if someone earns it for you, but rather freely giving it. Just as you have freely received it. This is the beauty of this parable. It's not all go and do likewise, but rather see what has been done for you. See yourself as the man lying lifeless along the side of the road and watch as your Savior lifts you up. I highly doubt that any city or state will ever pass the, the Seinfeld Good Samaritan Law. But as Christians, we don't need it. Because you see, it's no longer a weight hanging around your neck. When someone asks you that question, or when you're tempted to ask that question yourself, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You look to the cross. Because that's where Jesus says, you have to do nothing. I have done it all. Now go and share that love with my created world. What love? What blessing, what privilege that is to do. May we take that to heart as we are salt and light for the world. In Christ's name, amen.